for coming along this evening, um, particularly uh, given the heavy showers that we were experiencing uh, earlier. We thought uh, that might dampen things, but it hasn't, so thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, this evening uh, John Steenhazen, uh, the leader of the Democratic Alliance in South Africa, uh, who's going to talk to us on opposition parties and the future of South African democracy. I think as everyone here knows and those joining online know, uh, South Africa's democracy is entering a new chapter. In the 2021 municipal election, no party secured more than 50% of the votes for the first time in a poll since 1994. The Democratic Alliance and other opposition parties are seeking to capitalize on the waning support for the ANC, the long dominant party of government, and the next elections in 2024 could mark the potential advance towards pluralist national governance in the country, including the prospect of an executive coalition. Our speaker here this evening, John Steenhazen, is the leader of the Democratic Alliance, the DA, the largest opposition party in South Africa. The party has positioned itself as the anti-corruption party, emphasizing its reputation for effective governance in the Western Cape and metropolitan areas across the country. John has this week been tweeting about the clean audits the metros governed by the party have received, and I'm sure we'll hear more on that this evening. However, critics question the party's ability to attract voters from beyond its core base. We hosted John on Zoom in June 2020, uh, and so we're delighted to welcome him into this room physically, in which each of his predecessors as party leader have also spoken. Over the next hour, John will discuss his vision for the party and the country, including the experiences of municipal coalitions and prospects for their replication at the national level. He will also reflect a bit on his recent visit to Ukraine and present his vision of an alternative South African foreign policy. So quickly, before I let John get into uh, the meat of the meeting, uh, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, this meeting is being held on the record. Uh, we are at Chatham House, but it is not under the Chatham House rule. It is on the record. Uh, we ask that uh, you make sure that your mobile phones are on silent. Uh, and for those of us joining online, you're very welcome. Uh, all of our attendees are going to be muted throughout the presentations, but you will be able to use the Q&A function throughout the event to submit your questions. Uh, I have a laptop here. I will be following those questions as they come through, and so will my team who will be helping curate them uh, and raising them to my attention. Uh, for those who are tweeting the event, uh, we use the hashtag CHAfrica. So, John Steenhazen was elected as the leader of the Democratic Alliance at the DA Federal Congress in November 2020. He previously assumed the role of interim federal leader from November 2019, having served previously as the chief whip of the official opposition from May 2014 to October 2019. He's been a public representative for over 20 years and has been serving as a member of the National Assembly since July 2011. John, we're delighted that you've been able to join us here on your visit to London this evening, and we very much look forward to hearing your vision for South Africa, reflecting on your time in Ukraine, uh, and uh, your hopes for your time here in London as well. So please, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher, for that wonderfully uh, warm uh, uh, introduction. And thank you very much to the ladies and gentlemen that have come out today to come and listen to me here in London and for giving up your precious time to do so. Uh, as Christopher said, I had uh, the honor of addressing Chatham House around two years ago. And back then, I unfortunately had to do it via Zoom. And that was when the world was still coming to terms uh, with this whole COVID pandemic that would then go on to cause incredible harm and damage to, to many economies uh, around the world, uh, as well as the incredible suffering and loss uh, felt in many of those communities. And it really does feel, being here, that so much has changed since then. I think the last few years have seen world economies taken to the brink. Uh, sectors such as tourism and hospitality, in particular, have been incredibly hard hit uh, by the COVID pandemic. And there are many, many businesses that didn't survive uh, the pandemic and have had to close and did not survive many of the lockdown restrictions that were put on them. Those that did have barely held on by a thread and many had to simply reinvent the way in which they operated. But today the world's traveling again, which I'm very glad for, and that's why I'm glad to be here in London. 
And South Africa's last remaining restrictions, you'll be happy to know, have been lifted. Our masks have come off, our stadiums are now full capacity, and our concerts are able to take place, and our conference venues are now very much open for business again. It's absolutely wonderful, finally, in South Africa to see all the tourists coming back into the country. We need the foreign uh, revenue and we need their business, uh, especially as tourism is one of our beautiful country's most unique selling propositions. And it was absolutely uh, wonderful to touch down in London and to be able to bring some good South African weather with us, which I hope you're all enjoying, uh, thanks, to, thanks to what we packed in our suitcases. Um, yeah, exactly. So I think we're also ready to welcome the world back into South Africa and to let you all know that we haven't been resting on our laurels these past two years, which I'm afraid your Welsh team is about to discover to their peril when they take on the recharged spring box uh, uh, on Saturday. And I'm sure they're going to receive a South African welcome that, uh, that won't, they won't forget. I don't travel overseas often contrary to what you may read in the South African media. But when I do, it does seem to attract the attention of a wide variety of detractors and certainly gets them riled up. And as some of you know, and Christopher's mentioned, I recently traveled to the Ukraine and spent a week in and around Lviv and Kiev, meeting with Ukrainian leaders, uh, opposition parties, governing parties, uh, members, academics, civil society, uh, members of parliament, chairpersons of committees, to get really a first-hand sense of, of what was going on in the country, and also to express some solidarity from the South African people with the Ukrainians, despite the cowardly and immoral position that's been taken by South Africa's government uh, in terms of this particular uh, war uh, that is being waged. And of course, my trip was met with howls of indignation from government, particularly, uh, and there was much hand-wringing and tut-tutting from the, the chattering classes. And what does Stian Aislin think he's doing over there in the Ukraine? Doesn't he have more pressing matters to worry about here in South Africa? And that was what they all furiously typed into their press releases and op-eds. And the short answer to that is simply this. I'm the leader of the official opposition in South Africa, a party that governs for over 20 million South Africans. And uh, runs the province of the Western Cape and is uh, presiding over in direct control or in coalition of 38 metros and municipalities. So I'm very well able to deal with pressing matters back home, as well as representing the view of the majority of South Africans who, frankly, find Russia's behavior abhorrent in this particular situation, that it is absolutely the antithesis of the values and principles enshrined in our own constitution and in our own Bill of Rights. And it has been very disappointing to see South Africa's government taking the position that they have in this particular matter um, and really not standing on the side of the very values and principles that we should be promoting around the globe and instead siding with, uh, with the Russian government. But as they say in politics, and I think it's a the 50th anniversary of the Watergate scandal this year, follow the money, I think was the, was the famous uh, line there. And when you follow the money in South Africa, it all starts to fit into place because you have a situation where a potential nuclear deal with the Russians is very much firmly on the governing party's agenda. But also when you look at the funding of the ANC itself, their single largest donor as a political party is a Putin-linked oligarch uh, who's involved in business with the ANC through their corrupt arm Chancellor House um, by the name of Victor Vexelberg. And he is one of the last remaining donors to the ANC that they do declare. Um, and it's very obvious from those. But back to the Ukraine, while I was there, I obviously had to listen to the DA's critics and, and you know, listen to them. But if you actually had to take their advice, you would end up moderating your behavior according to their whims and fancies. And if you were to do that, and if I was to do that, at the end of the day, you would be nothing, do nothing, and see nothing. And I don't think that's what you want from an opposition party, and I don't think it's what you want from a party that's responsible for decision making in large parts of South Africa. And so, sadly, our country remains a place where 
so many in the commentariat uh, still cannot see beyond uh, the, the, the ANC becoming a minority party. And so they cannot imagine a South Africa without the ANC firmly in charge uh, of the country. And intellectually, they know that the party is done. But for some reason, for some emotional reason, they still remain completely invested in it. And you always hear about the, the, the great revival that's happening. And uh, unfortunately, it never ever comes to pass. The reforms that we told are just around the corner. The major realignment that's just around the corner. We're really not going to steal much this time. We're going to be very good and not be involved in corruption. That's just around the corner. And then you end up with a situation like our president finds himself in with uh, large sums of foreign currency stuffed into a couch in his private home and uh, stubbornly refusing to answer any questions about that. Uh, and I don't know who's advising him, but uh, in politics, you know, you need to get out there ahead of your detractors and explain what is going on there, because in the absence of that, it's being, the vacuum is being filled by speculation and, and narratives that are not very, uh, not very complementary of Mr. Ramaphosa. And this is dangerous territory for someone like him because he has essentially styled and modeled his entire presidency on being Mr. Clean and fighting corruption. And yet now he finds himself in this damaging situation. And so my trip to the Ukraine was met with the usual media pylon and uh, but this was no different to the media pile on that this party, is, our party, the DS, had to endure over many, many decades and almost on every single topic that we've, that we've ever had to raise. So we were called all sorts of terrible things, for instance, when we dared to put up a poster that said, Stop Zuma. It was sort of an outrage. How could you put up a, a poster saying, Stop Jacob Zuma? Uh, you know, this is not, not cricket. This is not fair. It's not what you do in politics. And... We did that precisely because we knew what his presidency was going to mean for South Africa. And we felt it our duty as the official opposition to warn South Africans about what would come. And after all that outrage of our posters, well, at the end of Mr. Zuma's term of office, before he was uh, moved out by his party and the pressure was on, well, you had almost every South African marching up and down the street with stop Zuma signs. So we were ahead of, the, ahead of our times there. Um, we were called unpatriotic and, and racist for daring to shatter the myth of the ANC and warning about the dangers of state capture. You can trace back the alarm bells that were sounded by the opposition all the way back and yet simply ignored. The role of the ANC's cater deployment and the role that that played, where we dared to talk about cater deployment, we were called all sorts of terrible names. And where we were, we're still then basted by the ANC today for daring to take on their elite enrichment scheme called BEE and for uh, resisting the ANC's attempts to nationalize private property in South Africa, to expropriate private property without compensation, under, undermining one of the key foundational tenets of any foundational democracy, and that's um, the right to respect property and the right to own private property. And we're still fighting these battles because we've got a government that's still stuck very much in the Cold War dynamic, who think that the Berlin Wall is still up and that Leonard Brezhnev is still presiding in the Kremlin, and it's a Cold War reduced to two great powers that are still fighting. And of course, we are right on all of these things that we raised, not that we got any credit for us, and I'm convinced that like our position on Ukraine and like the position we've taken on cater deployment and triple BEE, that history will again prove that we were right to raise these things, we were right to sound the alarm, and we were absolutely spot on. And as we speak, the last volume, the recently released last volume of the Zondo Commission of Inquiry um, has been released. And that too has proven us right on almost every single one of the things that we have raised over the past 20 years. And it has essentially now exposed the ANC as one major extractive syndicate masquerading as a government and a political party. And, the, and we and many others have pinned rightly the blame on the ANC's policy of cadre deployment, where essentially mem loyal party members are deployed into state-owned entities, into uh, key positions in government, into positions where they're able to influence, not for the benefit of the people, but 
for the benefit of a small reinforcing network of well-connected uh, individuals. And it has cost South Africa billions and billions and billions of rand in revenue and lost opportunity, which we will never get back. And if we'd listened to the critics, or if we'd been more sensitive to uh, the, uh, the terrible things that they were saying about us over the years, I don't think stand, South Africa would be standing at the crossroads that it does ahead of the 2024 election, where the nation very much looks like it's contemplating the end of its relationship with the African National Congress. So someone had to say all of these things. Someone had to point them out and bust all of the myths long before it was comfortable and long before it was popular to do so. And thankfully, our party is filled with deeply patriotic, caring people who are committed to South Africa and committed to its people. And they've had to roll with the punches, and they've taken incredible abuse over the years, not just from our political opponents, but from all sectors, including sometimes even the media, until a critical mass of people finally uh, prepared and rallied to admit that we were right all along when we issued warnings and connected the dots. But this has always been part of the DA's DNA. Uh, 60 years ago, our predecessor party, the Progressive Party, fought a lone battle in South Africa's parliament against the mighty Nationalist Party apartheid government. And when I say alone, I mean alone. I'm literally one member of parliament in the entire legislature. And so for 13 years, Helen Sussman was the party's only representative in the National Assembly. And a lesser person, or someone with lacking the conviction and courage that she had, would have wilted under the endless barrage of hatred, of heckling, of insults that she faced on a daily basis uh, from the National Party. She was called unpatriotic. She was called a traitor to South Africa for daring to speak out against the country's oppressive laws. She was mocked and ridiculed for visiting the country's political prisoners. And she was called a racist for speaking up on their behalf in Parliament. On one such occasion, she was accused of embarrassing South Africa with her questions, to which her famous answer was, it's not my questions that embarrass South Africa. It is your answers. And she was a woman of great courage and great principle. And she played an invaluable role in holding government to account at a time when it was very easy for people just to remain silent and go with the flow in South Africa. Now, six decades later, South Africa is barely recognizable from that uh, racist and oppressive regime. But there are some things that have not changed that all that much in South Africa. And being a principled and outspoken opposition in this in country of like South Africa is still not easy, just as it was not easy back then. When the truth shatters myths and makes people uncomfortable, the immediate reaction is often to attack the people speaking those truths. And widespread acceptance only comes uh, along much, much later. In the, the role of opposition in a democracy to hold those in power to account and to do so even when it is a thankless task, then I'm proudly able to say that I think the Democratic Alliance has fulfilled this role with distinction. And today we're not alone in this either. There's now groundswell of support for real change in South Africa, political, economic, and social change that spans civil society, the business community, and, of course, other opposition parties. And a perceptible shift, I believe, has taken place in recent time, where, for the first time, almost three decades into democracy, an ANC government is no longer considered a given or an, inev an, an inevitability. It's no longer the default. South Africans across all uh, ages, all races, and all um, social groups are able to see that there can be a different future. And the catalyst for this was last year's local government elections, which for the first time in post-democratic South Africa, the ANC was bought below 50%. And that is a significant psychological but also political milestone. And we obviously need to make sure that we take massive advantages. Now, in many of the councils that the ANC lost in that election, 
It was the opposition parties that came together to unseat them. And this has afforded South Africans, I believe, a very valuable opportunity to experience a test run, a dress rehearsal, of what a post-ANC 2024 government can look like before they actually have to go to those polls again. What's more, voters who want to make an informed decision now have a range of options to look at. They can judge the different types of government now around the country. They can look at the different non-ANC governments, those with outright DA majorities, those with stable coalitions, those with less stable minority governments like Ecoleni. And it comes as no surprise, of course, that the stable coalitions and the outright majorities obviously outperform minority governments and unstable uh, coalitions. Uh, but it is the margin of difference that is perhaps surprising. Um, the week before last, the Auditor General, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to remind me because I couldn't let this one go away, uh, released the annual uh, Municipal Audit Outcomes, which takes a comprehensive look at all the aspects of municipal governance. And the only DA-run province, the Western Cape, 73% of municipalities within the Western Cape achieved a clean audit. Now, just to show you the difference, across the remaining eight A and C provinces, the result was a paltry 8%, average of 8%. 73%, 8%. Shows you the very, very clear difference between um, those two, two parties. So, our party prides itself on those audit outcomes, and I'm very proud of our teams in those municipalities that are making these things possible. Because we know that clean governance is a direct result of, tire, of tireless efforts to build a capable state, a state that's able to deliver, a transparent state where money is spent on the people and their needs and delivery and not on politicians. Unlike the ANC, we don't deploy party cadres for their loyalty because we know that that is a shortcut to the trough and state capture and eventually erosion of your basic ability to even deliver. And as we've seen in towns and cities around South Africa, a complete collapse of all forms of service delivery. So when the Auditor General confirms this absolutely incredible, astonishing statistical correlation between DA local governments and clean audits, we feel entirely vindicated. But still, there are critics who will say to us, yeah, but you can't eat a clean audit. What does this all mean for poor South Africans? And that is why, in order to fully appreciate that report, you have to read it in conjunction with a variety of other reports. And you need to take into account some of the other critical statistics in South Africa. Right now, in South Africa, almost 46% of adult South Africans cannot find work. This is one of the highest unemployment rates in the world, and when you add the youth unemployment rate into that, that shoots up to well over 70%. This is not a sustainable model or situation for any country, let alone a country like South Africa. And coupled with this is a large proportion of what our economists and number crunchers euphemistically call discouraged work seekers. These are people who have simply given up the prospect of even going out to look for a job. And while they're still counted in the broad unemployment rate, our government excludes them from its official definition of unemployment, but I believe that they are the real measure of a country like South Africa's failure to bring hope to its people. Now, 29.5%, which is still unacceptably high, and something which would probably be rejected in most countries in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, the Western Cape's broad unemployment is a full 16.5 percentage points lower than the national average of 45.5 percent. Statistically speaking, that is poles and worlds apart. Another set of data which must be read alongside the Auditor General's report is Stat South Africa's General Household Access Survey, which looks at things like access to basic services, uh, schooling, housing, water and electricity, and here too the benefits of living under a DA government are undeniable. Whether we're talking about access to piped water, to, to electricity, refuse removal, whether they're taking the number of children who attend preschool, whether we're taking the number of children who stay in school until their schooling time is finished, 
or whether they're talking about the households that derive their income from a salary rather than as opposed to a government grant, the one DA-run province stands up head and shoulders above the rest of the country. Now, we call this the DA difference. While clean audits may sound dry and technical, these other things, clean water, electricity, schooling, and jobs are most certainly tangible in people's lives. And the two are inextricably linked. And we fundamentally believe that if we're able to demonstrate to those 30 million South Africans who live under DA government of some form or the other, the tangible difference between service delivery that they're used to and service delivery that they are now receiving, if they can see, feel, and taste that difference, that we will be able to move the needle electorally where people are going to vote for a government that is doing things for them rather than simply looting the state. And so if you want to see a clear and immediate comparison, you need look no further than the dire water situation which is now taking place in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa uh, in the Nelson Mandela Bay metropolitan area. Their dams are about to run dry after a period of sustained drought and are now bracing for the inevitable, which is known as day zero back in South Africa. Nelson Mandela could well be the very first uh, major metropolitan area in the world to run out of water. And the reason everybody knows what day zero is because the DA-run city of Cape Town faced the prospect of its own day zero uh, a few years ago. The cons uh, three consecutive years of drought meant that the dams were running dry uh, and were close to empty before the relief of some winter rainfall was able to save the day. But that's where the two comparisons, uh, where the comparison between these two absolutely comes to a stop because the response to these crises by the respective local governments could not be more different, even if you tried. In addition to the number of water augmentation uh, mechanisms that were put in place and the obsessive effort to fix leaks and prevent wastage, the city of Cape Town, along with the Western Cape Provincial Government, also ran a groundbreaking public awareness campaign, which was able to manage the demand side of water usage. And this was consistently communicated to the residents. And the result of this was a massive reduction in the water usage and which the metro would have definitely run out of water if that had not been the case. And the city is rightly being bestowed now with international awards for how you handle situations like a day zero. In contrast, the ANC government in Nelson Mandela Bay has remained absolutely quiet and ominously still about the impending day zero. And now with mere days of water left, it's only now starting to frantically run around trying to plug the 3,000 leaks that plague that particular city. And the difference between these two cities is simple. One had a stable government with an obsessive focus on delivery and transparency, and the other has a council paralyzed by, corrupt, by a corrupt and an unstable coalition of over nine parties. And sometimes that difference can honestly be a matter between life and death. And elsewhere in the country, South Africans are bracing themselves for what I call a winter of discontent. As fuel prices continue to spiral as a result of Russia's war on Ukraine, well, you know, we're also now praying that the ANC's factional battle doesn't spill over onto the streets of South Africa as it did in July last year. And it goes without saying that there's been a number of reports in South Africa that rank the ANC's internal instability as one of the largest security risks that we face uh, as a nation in South Africa. But despite all this, and despite the extreme poverty, despite the unemployment, despite the inequality numbers that are still unacceptably high in South Africa, and that continue to move in the wrong direction every year, there is now a palpable sense of change in South Africa. People can feel something is going to happen. People can sense that there's finally an opportunity to bring the change. People are acutely aware of two parallel timelines, the systematic destruction of the country and the implosion of the African National Congress. Instinctively, everybody now knows that South Africa's future depends on the timing of these two major events. Should the ANC manage to weather the storm just long enough to survive as a party of national government into another election cycle, the chances of the country's survival 
our advance will deteriorate significantly and very, very sharply. But should the ANC continue to lose support at its current trajectory and become a minority party by our next election? And should a multi-party coalition then succeed in relegating the ANC to the opposition benches, South Africa will have a fighting chance of some form of recovery. And the timing couldn't possibly be tighter for this. And the stakes could not be higher. The next two years, without wanting to be dramatic, could literally make or break South Africa's future. But we're under no illusions what is in store for us in the immediate future. The final kicks of the ANC as their factions battle out for the last scraps of spoils of the, uh, of the, of the state are going to be a significant risk and will bring mass disruption and a lot of chaos. This is something we're going to have to navigate carefully while maintaining the integrity of our institutions of democracy. And it's critical that these next elections remain free and fair because we've seen on the continent what happens when governments become desperate to hang on to power and hang on to authority. And once we've navigated our way past the elections, we could then face a daunting task of having to constitute and manage a new coalition government comprised of a substantial number of smaller parties. Such is the nature of our democracy, because in every single election, we see the birth of a, uh, the birth of a host of new parties, many of them would succeed in winning just a few small votes uh, to secure them a seat at the table. And these one or two percent parties often become critical to the balance of power within these coalitions, making these governments unstable and incredibly challenging. And that's what we're seeing in Nelson Mandela Bay, where we desperately are trying to form some form of coalition there to get in and rescue the city, to bring the expertise that we have as a party in, in fighting day zero to the city. But some of these small parties demand that they must be the mayor or they will be the speaker despite only having one seat, making these uh, coalitions incredibly unstable. But the thing is that there is one party that can manage these situations and steer these councils through that, through these waters of minority parties and also the kingmaker egos that you see uh, emerging. It is the Democratic Alliance. In fact, we were the only party in South Africa with a successful coalition history. Uh, the watershed local government election that you saw um, in Cape Town in 2006 um, was an eight-party coalition that was able to be put together by Helen Zilla. And it's completely fundamentally changed uh, this, the future of the city of Cape Town, the trajectory now, where it is the most successful major metropolitan uh, city in, in South Africa and certainly amongst the best on the continent. And if the current mayor, Jordan Lewis, has his way, certainly the world. And the interesting thing about those coalitions is once the ANC has moved into opposition, they wither and die on the vine. They are not able to navigate an environment where there's no patronage or positions or opportunities to the point now where in a place like the Western Cape, the ANC has all but disappeared as a major political force. I think they've got four branches uh, in, in the Western Cape. And as we have now shut the ANC out of government in the four big metros in Gauteng, there too they're struggling. We found people who are on the books of the municipality being paid as municipal employees, but the report to work at the Tuli House. And we've been able to bring that to an end. And so once those doors of patronage or the ATMs are shut off, it becomes a lot harder for the ANC to have that glue of patronage keeping there together. But by always placing our party's non-negotiable governance principles at the heart of every decision, every policy, and every budget, we have successfully kept coalitions together since this last election. And I have never seen such a positive turnaround in as many metros as we've seen. The lessons we learned in Cape Town, along with our current experience in leading coalition governments, have given us all the tools we need to achieve the same success at a national level. And key to this, is the very first step in negotiating any possible coalition agreement is placing those non-negotiable principles on the table. Respect for the rule of law and the constitution, non-racialism, a social market economy that recognizes the state does have a role to play, but it must be confined to doing that role and not trying to crowd out the private sector, and a capable state that serves the people of South Africa and is not some party apparatus. And I think that by placing our party's values 
at the center of these new coalitions that will emerge after this next election, I think that it is great hope for the future of South Africa, and that finally we can build a South Africa of peace, opportunity, and prosperity. We can have a South Africa that not only looks inwards at its own people, but also outwards as it starts to cement its rightful place uh, in the international world. A nation that abhors the oppressors, as you see in Russia, a nation that empathizes with the oppressed and does not side uh, with the aggressors in a situation. A South Africa not afraid to stand up to the strongmen of the world and just always stand up to bullies by choosing the side of peace, of justice, and of human rights. That is the South Africa that we envisage in the DA. That's the South Africa that we get up every morning to fight for. And we know it is possible to achieve it, and we know that it can happen in this next election in 2024. We now have two years to convince voters in South Africa that this is within reach. So in this next two years, the DA is going to be wearing its two hats very carefully. One is a principled opposition, and the other as a capable government to show voters that not only has it come time for a post-ANC world and South Africa, but also that a credible alternative with a proven track record does exist. And if democratic South Africa's first post-ANC government has the DA values and the DA's work ethic at its center, I believe that our amazing country is going to be given the best fighting chance at making a full recovery and stepping boldly into a bright new future. If that isn't worth fighting for, then I really don't know what is. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much. Uh, that leaves us with, we'll go over a little bit because we started a little late, so we'll go for another 25 minutes for, for questions and answers. Uh, I'll take the first round from within the room. I know that there's a number of people who have questions here. I will remind those online, uh, you can submit your questions uh, through the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, there are two already in there, and I'll come to those after we've taken a round in the room. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go. So uh, first one here in the front row, uh, and then the gentleman behind. Uh, hi, John. Um, as a South African, I would very much like to see a change of government because at the age of grand old age of 72, I've only had one change of government in my entire life. <laughs> and frankly, that is not a democracy. Uh, but if people are going to vote for, for the DA, uh, in what you say is likely to be a multi-party democracy, is that one, I mean, in a multi-party uh, coalition, are you going to spell out what that coalition will look like before the election? Will you go into an election pact and come out and say, well, these are the parties that we think we will, will bring into government if we are elected? Or is this something that South Africans will only discover after the election has taken place? Thank you. Uh, question behind. Yeah. Uh, I'm Andrew Weir from uh, Africa Confidential. Uh, We've heard a lot how in the past, uh, well, since 94, the social gaps between the poorest and the richest has got much greater in South Africa. And uh, there are many aspects to trying to restore uh, equality or equitability. But what I'm wondering is, uh, does the DA believe there is an honest, equitable way of doing BEE? Uh, and one from Anu, please. Please introduce yourself, Anu, as well. Hi, uh, I'm Anu with Chatham House. Uh, as you said, uh, at last year's election, the ANC dipped below 50% in the national vote, but that did not necessarily uh, lead to an increase in the vote share for the DA. In fact, the DA's uh, vote share dropped by 5.3% from the last municipality elections. So how does the how will your party gain uh, more votes if, as we, as analysts predict, the ANC will shed uh, more disgruntled voters in 2024? Thank you. Uh, we'll come back for a second round. I will uh, just collate what we've had from online because it fits with what Martin was asking at the beginning, sure. uh, which is uh, <laughs> essentially, um, would you go into co which parties would you go into coalition with? Uh, are there any parties that you would not go into a coalition with? Uh, and the issue of kind of practicalities of coalitions for the purpose of 
um, changing governments um, versus uh, coalitions as a point of ideology. So, great. Thanks. Thanks, Martin, uh, for that question, and, and it is a good one. And it is something I think that as the opposition, we're going to have to weigh up as the election approaches. There are two schools of thought. The one school of thought is that each party you know, should go out and try and maximize its vote and bring that to the table in some form or, or another. And we have learned some hard lessons in the past where we went out and announced a pact before the election, and it ends up harming you. So the example I would give you is the so-called, what we subsequently called the collision for change, the coalition for change with the IFP in KwaZulu-Natal, where we'd been in a coalition with them. We had two MECs in government with them to keep the ANC out. And then we went into the election and, and punted it that we were going to you know, you know, go in as a united force, as the coalition for change. Well, it switched off a large part of the DP's votes at the time because a lot of our traditionals didn't like you know, the whole stance on Ulundi. And it switched off a large part of the IFP's voters. It didn't like them working with you know, a bunch of white liberals who wanted to remove the capital from Ulundi to Peter Maritzburg. So it's, you know, you've got to be careful about it. Sometimes you should rather take uh, the, take the, the, the scores of the parties that are able to go and hunt in their, in their groups to go and maximize it. And that's also why I think it is important that as opposition parties, we don't spend our time attacking each other, that we focus on going out and taking votes off the ANC. It's not going to help South Africa to weaken the DA or you know, weaken one of the other opposition parties. We need to be hunting for votes from, from disgruntled ANC voters and using each other's unique strengths and unique markets and unique reach to be able to go out and maximize that vote and bring it back to the table. So I think we'd have to weigh it up. Uh, and I think there's already some talk about, well, you know, can't you guys you know, come together and consider one presidential candidate or the like? We're op I'm open to anything. I'm open to anything that I believe is going to be able to bring that change in 2024 and which is founded on those values and principles that I spoke about, which leads me to the second part of the question. If you bring it down to values and principles, and I think that that has to be the, 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 the reason for the realignment, I don't think that a coalition for coalition's sake, just to keep the ANC out, uh, it will necessarily work if it doesn't have a values-based foundation. And again, a lesson from experience. The arrangement with the economic freedom fighters in Johannesburg became very difficult because you know, naturally, they wanted to start extracting rents from their proximity to the DA's relationship in Joburg. And you, know, you only need to read the Daily Maverick and others to find out exactly what happened there with fleet contracts and appointments of municipal staff, et cetera. And so you don't want to be in a coalition where your core values and principles are compromised. So that's why we've distilled it down to those four key things. Not, not, um, respect for the rule of law and the Constitution includes the fight against corruption and maladministration, clean, accountable government, uh, a, so, a, a social market economy that sees business as a partner for growth, um, building a capable state, and then um, making sure that you're able to combat corruption and, and the like. Those are the core foundational. And if we can use those, those principles and values as a centrifugal force around which the, co the ecosystem for change can start to develop, I think we will start to move in, in the right direction. So it'll be very difficult, for instance, for us to go into, into government with EFF. I, mean, I ruled it out completely this election. I think we, the voters needed to know that they wouldn't take our vote and, then, and we wouldn't then waste it on you know, going into, into bed with people who don't live those values and principles. And I think that there are many people in South Africa who are wearing different political t-shirts right now, but who can find common cause with those values and principles including some people that I think are on the ANC benches that you know, believe in those core values and principles. And I think it's about getting those people together around those values to build a new majority, to find a, a strong, uh, stable center that's going to be a bulwark against the radical left, uh, because that's where the next co uh, coalescence, I think, is going to start taking place. And if we don't develop that center, we're going to cede that to, that to them. Um, Andrew's question, it's an excellent question, and, uh, and, and it's absolutely something the DA has spent a lot of time on. Uh, there's no denying that apartheid has caused huge inequality, spatially, economically, socially. Uh, even the, 
design of many of our cities is, you know, reflects that still in South Africa. And it's not acceptable, almost 30 years on, that you know, these rates and, and these gaps are widening, they're not narrowing. And so our policy, our alternative to triple BWE, focuses on poverty, using poverty as the measure for the people who must benefit from uh, government's advancement or government's assistance or, or empowerment. And if you use poverty as a measure, well, 99.5% of the people in South Africa are poor or automatically black South Africans anyway because of our racially divided past. And so without then having to create an elite capture and an elite uh, price gouging model and elite that gets very rich with very little um, growth for um, broad-based black economic empowerment, that, that you're able to focus where the need is. And the model's there already in both NISFIS uh, the, the student financial system it doesn't look at race. It looks at your are you, you know, are you do you meet the criteria for the need. The social welfare system works exactly the same way. And I think if we remove race out of it and use the criteria of poverty, you'll make sure that the right people getting the empowerment are the people who actually need government's help, not the billionaires and and trillionaires um, who, who are there. Um, Thanks very much. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, it's accepted. The, the DA's vote did go down from the previous election, municipal election. I think we went up, you know, if you look at elections on the steps, and I know people say that's a cheat, but, you know, I think we, we, we were able to recover some from 2019, and had the 2019 result been extrapolated into that election, I think we would have been a lot worse off. Um, I also think that the 2016 election took place in a completely different uh, atmosphere. I mean, you had Zuma. The, where the height of the Zuma must fall, uh, the height of the ANC's disillusionment. This election took place, uh, local government election took place still with the last embers of Ramaphoria, I think still, uh, still struggling to glow, but it, they were there. And we have to grow our vote. A large part of the reason we're in power in many of these cities is that large numbers of ANC voters didn't go out and vote. The job of the opposition now for the next two years has got to be to go to those voters and say to him, well, just not voting and sitting it out is not going to cut it. That if you really want to see the change, you've got to actually come out and vote for you know, a, a change. And you've got to vote for one of the parties that's going to be able to help bring that change. It's not good enough just to sit and, and opt out of the system. And that particularly is going to apply to young voters. We had a record um, stay away from young voters who just don't see politics as a means of addressing their concerns, their uh, you know, their hopes, their dreams, and their aspirations. And that's on us as political parties. And we've got a lot of work to do over the next, uh, uh, over the next two years in re-energizing that space and showing those young people that if you want change and you want a better life and you want a decent shot at the future, you want an economy and a government that's working for you, well, it doesn't just happen. You've got to vote for it and to convince them that the power of their vote is far more powerful than a ballot, uh, than a bullet, or, uh, or or something else of, of protest or a stone, and you know that's on us as political parties, and you know we've got to up our game significantly there, and that's why you know, we're specifically spending a huge amount of time in the 18 to 35 year old market trying to re-energize. Um, it's about getting young people into office so that young people see something of themselves reflected in the leadership, and that's why I'm very chuffed to have brought my deputy chief whip here with me, Saviwe, I think you, uh, Gwarube, who's, I think you're the youngest chief whip, deputy chief whip in the history of the party. Um, and you know, there she is leading from the front, not being told, well, you spend 20 years in the youth wing before you can, you know, come. there she's leading from the front in parliament. And I think if we're able to demonstrate young people in leadership positions, that we can re-energize those people as well. Uh, we had three from this side, so we'll go for three from uh, this side now. Uh, gentlemen in the back row, uh, uh, back row, and then uh, the front here. Yeah. Hi, a uh, question around coalition governments. Um, so you seem to have ruled out the EFF. Um, on a national level, obviously, we haven't done coalition politics in South Africa yet. So. If the DA is in a kingmaker role, um, how does it approach the situation where probably ideologically it's got more in common with the ANC? Um, does it sit it out? Does it kind of do an issue-based approach as is currently the, the, the 
approach that you've adopted, or have you applied your mind to principles around which you could get into bed with the ANC? And if you could just introduce yourself for those who don't know. Arona uh, Kopalda, Signal Risk. Yeah. Hi there, I'm Daniel Conway from the University of Westminster. And I mean, as you know, one of the big problems and sort of challenges in the South African democracy is the tendency for elections to be like a racial census. And, you know, obviously opinion polls and there's some evidence of that shifting. But one of the main sort of challenges I think you've faced and, and the DA's faced as a party is accusations of racism, um, having a sort of white leadership. Um, and I wonder if you could maybe talk about tackling those challenges and when you approach the sort of South African electorate, particularly the electorate outside of the Western Cape, um, how will you overcome those challenges of racism and the sort of, you know, the fact you're, you know, you have a white, a, a white leadership in a, in a sense. So. Uh, and then the front row here. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Maurice Ritt from the SA Institute of Race Relations. Uh, so, say the DA does is in charge of a uh, coalition uh, post 2024. There's President Stian Eisen with an office in the Union Buildings. What would your three priorities be? Your three immediate priorities? And just a second quick question: What is your view on the new electoral amendment bill? Which I think is it's frankly a mess, and it's actually surprised me it's got this far. And I don't know if there's going to be time to actually come up with a proper amend, uh, new electoral system before the, the, the December deadline. Thank you very much. Um, before you answer those, for those who are joining on Zoom, uh, I've got a hand up and I've got uh, plenty of questions in the Q&A box. So I will come to the Q&A box just now. Uh, if you do want to ask your question live, um, please do raise your hand. Uh, I know that there's at least one person that we will definitely come to live. Uh, and uh, yeah, for anyone else who wants to, please do use the function to raise your hand. Um, but first, yeah, John. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Ronald, thanks. Um, it, it's impossible for us to go into coalition with the with the EFF because they believe the antithesis of those four core values. They are racial nationalists. They don't believe in the rule of law or the constitution. Although they cherry pick from it occasionally, but you know generally observe it in the breach. Um, they don't believe in a, in a in a social market economy or a role for the private sector. They believe fundamentally in state-led growth, and they don't believe in a, in a capable state. They believe in, in cadre deployment. They believe that the party should control the state, and you know the, the, the state must be all-powerful. So it's impossible for us to do something at a national level. If we find ourselves at, in a kingmaker role, there's a number of options. I, mean, I happen to think the ANC, there's a very good chance the ANC is going to split in some way or another after the December conference, because there's going to be victors and vanquished, and there's going to be there's going to be uh, people who leave there aggrieved and go off to do other things. There's already talk of you know, another organization that's going to then side with the EFF. There's, there's, all, there's all sorts of speculation there. And I don't think that the center can hold in the ANC much longer because if the president is now stuck. He can't do any of his reforms because he's boxed in by the people around him and he doesn't have the courage to stand up to them. So he's boxed in there. Uh, the RET faction are now being targeted and, and the crosshairs of the NPA and others. So, you know, they, they don't have room. So something's got to give there. And that would open up an opportunity for us to work with people who may exit the ANC, you know, an ANC that with the RET faction exit, it may be an option. But the other option that, that one looks at is, is the situation where you don't necessarily <coughs> go into government with the party concerned, but you take the oversight of that particular parliament or government, where you take the speaker and the committee chairs, and the other party takes the, the, you know, the government positions. And your job then is to exercise oversight over that and bring your values of good governance and, and massively strong accountability to that. that that's an option. Um, I prefer the option of a grouping of, of, of sorts around the rational center that's got a strong enough parliamentary majority to be able to to do the things that need to be done, precisely because we don't have a lot of time to, to spend. So we've got to drive the reform agenda in South Africa, because if we leave it for much longer, the prognosis is getting worse by the day. And it needs action and action now. They've been dithering and kicking the can down the road for far too long. So I'd prefer a, a three to four party coalition at the center with 
you know, those core values at its, at its core, being able to drive that. I think that a coalition above five becomes unwieldy and difficult. And we've seen it at municipal level. An 11-party coalition is, is what's happened in Nelson Mandela Bay now. It brings that instability. And you know, that's also what we're trying to do in Joburg and Chwani, is to demonstrate that these coalitions can be a stable form of alternative government, that they're not chaos. And you know, that's why it's, it's important that we, that we make, uh, make those work. Um, Daniel, yes, race is a factor in South Africa. It absolutely is. And <clears throat> it still bedevils politics. I would, I would advance it even in countries like the United States, where you know, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 63, I think it was, are still bedeviled by race, and, and, and their politics is, is poisoned by it. So it, it, is a, it is something we've got to deal with. And I would advance and say that there's, the top six of the DA is the most diverse out of any top six in the country. If you look at the ANC's top six, the EFF's top six, the Freedom Front's top six, the IFP's top six, you know, we've got white, Indian, black, and colored in, in our top six. The others are all monochromatic, and you know, I think that, that we need to demonstrate that diversity far more. I also fundamentally believe in, in moving the party away from a leadership cult. The party is bigger than the leader. The leader's got a job, it's their job to, to keep the show on the road and manage things. But I think that the DA's tendency in the past has always been to put the leader out there and say, well, this is the person. I prefer a team of people so that when somebody looks at the DA, they see someone like Saviwe, who's in a, in a senior role. They look at someone like Mimi Gondwe or Loyolo Mpiti or Zach Mbele, and they see them working with Dion George and Ashwell Sarupin, and that's the team. So that any South African looking at the DA sees something of themselves represented in that party. And I think if we're able to use diversity and the diversity that we have, because we are the most diverse party in Parliament, as a strength, rather than being it used as a weakness, I think it's better. I also happen to think that the situation in South Africa has got so desperate, so desperate, where grant recipients aren't paid for two months. And you know, we've got to go to court and to keep children fed in school feeding schemes. I think the situation that has got so dire that a lot of people are not going to worry too much about the color of the paramedic that's coming to save them. They're going to be wanting who's got the best experience, who's going to be able to get us out of the situation. And I think particularly amongst that younger voting uh, group, that's where you're starting to see it, where that age group, 18 to 35, are 40% more likely to switch their vote to another party. Um, than, 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 the other, than the age group above that. And that's where we've got to focus um, in, the next, uh, in the next election. Um, Marius, um, President Stian Hazen, goodness me, don't tell Milani for what she'll have a heart attack. Um, she need choked on her oats, I believe, the last time, shame. Um, there'll be th uh, three first things I'd do. First is I would deal with Eskim, because Eskim is the is the landmine on our balance sheet. Eskom can be dealt with very quickly. The state needs to drop the monopoly on generation and supply, allow the private sector in through independent power producers. And I think in doing that, we could well unleash a whole greenfield industry of new jobs as well in South Africa with renewable energy and, and, and the IPPs. And I think that allowing municipalities to procure electricity directly will mean that we can be load shedding free, I think, within a relatively short space of time. But I'm able to see what the city of Cape Town is able to do in preventing one full level of load shedding just with the hydroelectric power plant at Steenbras. Imagine what we could do with the unleashing of the private sector into that. And that's exactly, it's not rocket science. It's what, um, it's what Thailand did when they were faced with the same thing. Although their, their one was as a result of economic growth and, and, and rapid growth. They couldn't keep up with electricity. Ours is just failing infrastructure, inefficiency, and widespread corruption, and massive debt on the books. So I'd get that off. The second thing, I'd reduce the size of the cabinet and the state immediately. Our civil service is too big. Uh, it consumes far too much of our GDP, and it is grossly inefficient. And I think a trimmed down cabinet, I think the cabinet needs to be more than 20 people, um, a, a, a reduced cabinet, the reduced costs of running that cabinet, and the reduced civil service to shift that money off the books um, would be a priority. And then thirdly, focusing at the same time on reforming the education system, which I think is fundamentally broken in South Africa, and is not preparing young South Africans for the world of work out there. And we're being left behind continentally and internationally. And we better do something about that quickly, otherwise we're going to end up being a backwater. And fighting and jailing the corrupt, um, sending the clear message out to the world 
that we've put some senior heads on spikes. There's a new sheriff in town. Corruption uh, is not going to be tolerated. It doesn't matter if you're a former president, a former public protector, a former member of parliament, current member of parliament, or a mayor, or a speaker, or anyone. If you do corruption, you're going to have your head on the spark. And that's how countries like South Korea and the ones at the top of the index of transparency and accountability have been able to shift the needle against corruption, is by setting a solid, clear example of going after the top. In South Africa, we do the other thing. We go after the underlings, the, you know, the colonels and the you know, people at, at Waterkloof, rather than going after Zuma and Kulani and the real people who, who were behind it. Um, and I think that's, that's what needs to, needs to happen there. Um, yeah, I think that's it, eh? Huh? Um, so uh, we'll take uh, two questions uh, from Zoom in person. So we have two hands raised. Uh, the first of those will be David and Sarah. Uh, David, are you able to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? And we in the hall should be able to hear it through our speakers. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. So, John, thanks very much for your speech. I'm, I'm speaking from Johannesburg with the Centre for Risk Analysis. And you spoke about these uh, two parallel timelines, uh, the, essentially the destruction of South Africa and then the implosion of the ANC. So, on the first timeline on destruction, I think that the Western Cape government and various DA run municipalities have done well to uh, somewhat outperform ANC municipalities and other governments, um, but that is a relative performance. Um, but in many respects, uh, you know, your, your hands are tied. You can't, uh, for example, raise revenues independent of national treasury. Um, and you know many of the laws that pertain to safety and security, for example, uh, energy provision, etc., aren't within your scope and mandate. Is the DA doing enough to push back against hostile policy from Pretoria? Because you know, and I think actually ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Uh, I'm thinking of the Leap program, for example, which is a fairly successful collaboration between the City of Cape Town and the Western Cape Provincial Government to actually take law enforcement uh, responsibilities uh, into uh, your own hands and away from the South African Police Service, which is a national competence. Um, I'm also thinking about your principle of non-racialism. Could you give better expression to that by, for example, seeking exemptions from uh, any race-based procurement uh, requirements from the centre? So are you doing enough to, to push back against bad policy? David, thank you very much. Uh, and next we'll go to Stephen Hurt. Stephen, are you able to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks. My name is Stephen Hurt from Oxford Brooks University in the UK. Um, thanks for your talk. You said a lot about um, how you would address the ANC's problems of governance and said maybe a bit little, a bit less about um, how you would address the kind of socio-economic challenges of South Africa. And in particular, the structural legacies of apartheid. So we had a question earlier on BEE and you offered an alternative. And I wouldn't say on land, you were very critical of land expropriation. Do you tell us what an alternative way of addressing those structural legacies on land? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and uh, I've got um, uh, a few from our Chatham House Common Futures Conversations that have come in. Uh, the Common Futures Conversations project uh, is a unique and uh, tailor-made bespoke platform that Chatham House operates that connects young people from uh, multiple countries across Africa with multiple countries across Europe to have uh, debates on global policy issues. Uh, I'm going to read this question comes from Abu uh, Kogbo from Sierra Leone, um, but his question reflects what a number of uh, our uh, CFC colleagues have uh, asked. He said, as the leader of the biggest, par uh, biggest opposition party in South Africa, what mechanism or measures have your party put in place to prevent the rise in xenophobia against colleagues from uh, other African countries that settle in South Africa? Um, 
that's the most concise question on xenophobia that we had there. There were more that were far more uh, emotional. This is a significant issue we were discussing even before this. So um, three questions for you there. Uh, and then um, uh, on the back of what you were saying about uh, ESCOM, we've had a question from Antoinette Sala, uh, who has asked about the, uh, does South Africa have the technical and engineering capacity to overcome the environmental challenges such as droughts and climate change? So I'd add on to that a broader, what's the DA uh, perspective on uh, climate change policy, uh, including the 8.5 billion pledge from COP26 last year? There's a round for you. And then we'll have one final round from the floor. Great, thanks, um, David. Um, thanks very, very um, much for that question. I think it's a very important question because it speaks about the new battlefield for the DA where it's in government. So I spoke about the hats of us being in opposition and being a good opposition, but also where we're in government. And I think that the DA has tried its best to try and move the needle on these key areas where there's a failure by national government to perform its function and it is impeding and impacting on the ability of the other spheres, provincial and local, to be able to perform theirs. And I think that we've been far too polite to date, and I think that we've spent, as you would know, over 10 years in various court battles with national government to be able to procure independent power-produced electricity from municipalities that they can keep their lights on. I've given an instruction to, to our municipalities that they are now to go on the offensive. And I believe there's some significant low-hanging fruit in South Africa around greater federalism and greater devolution of power. I think the concurrent powers in the Constitution have not been used or pushed to nearly the edge of the envelope. And I think that the DA has got to be bold and brave and get out there and do that. And so I've instructed them to go out and fill the gap. Instead of us going to court to beg government to allow us to procure electricity so we can keep the lights on, we're going to go out there and do it. Uh, and we're going to go and do it, and then government must take the DA to court, or to take those governments to court, and explain to a judge why you are, they want to now prevent a municipality from keeping the lights on, keeping the jobs working, and keeping the economy turning. Let them explain to the court why we believe it's necessary, uh, they believe it's unnecessary for us to put officers on the trains because we need our public transport system uh, of our trains, which is not in the control of the province or national or, or, or local, but we need it to able, make our transport system work. And we can't have people who voted for us being attacked on the trains. We've got to protect them. And the LEAP program, I think, is, is a foot in the door, but I think we're going to have to expand it far more. And I think this is a fight that we're going to take to government. And, you know, we come in for a lot of stick uh, often. Oh, well, you only look after... Uh, you know, rich and wealthy areas is sort of the, the myth that the ANC uh, puts out there. That's sort of the piffle that they come up with every election. The, the reality is that the pilot project for, uh, for the, the policing program, Alan Windy bringing in police personnel, uh, putting funding up in partnership with the city, focused on Langa, which in the previous round of, of crime stats was the murder capital of South Africa. And the focus of on-the-ground policing at a local level has, I believe, uh, yielded the results because now Langa has fallen off that list and it shows that that works. But there's a greater, um, greater fight to be had around devolution. And this is why I think the Cape independence movement is a distraction away from the fight that we should be having which is how do we devolve more power and authority to local uh, municipalities, to provinces. International best practice shows that policing is done better when it's devolved to the lowest possible level closer to people. You can't run an integrated public transport system in a city when the province is responsible for the trains, um, uh, uh, for, for the buses, national is responsible for the trains, and the municipality is responsible for uh, you know, internal uh, tr uh, transport systems. It doesn't work. You need to locate the transport function at a central hub so it can be integrated properly and you end up with a situ situation like you have here in London. So it is a fight that I've tasked our DA mayors to go and pick fights with national government. And we can't sit on our hands and say, well, it's not a local government function anymore, or it's not a provincial function. It's people who voted for us 
and we need to shield and insulate them from the failures of national government. Stephen, you ask an excellent question, and I think the answer to that on land goes back to, well, assessing what the real problem is, because the debate of the last three years has focused on the wrong end of the pup. It's looked at the Constitution and tried to scapegoat the Constitution, saying that the Constitution's the impediment to meaningful land reform in South Africa. That's not the case. In fact, the Constitution, if read correctly, uh, creates an imperative for land reform in South Africa and provides the means to do so. If you look at the high-level panel report that was prepared by former ANC president and president of our republic, Karema Mutlanti, he lays out very carefully what the real impediments to land reform in South Africa have been, and those have been massive rent-seeking and the Frieda Dairy project that emerged from the Gupta report, uh, the Zondo Commission report, would show an example of that, where land has not been given to beneficiaries, it's been given to well-connected cadres, and it's not ending up in the right hands, and you end up with an elite capture of the process again. The budget, I think the budget for land reform in South Africa has very seldom breached 1% of GDP. Are you serious about land reform if you're putting such a small budget towards it? You know, show me your budget, and I'll show you what your priorities are with such a small budget that's been provided for land reform, is it really something you've taken seriously? And thirdly, um, the complete you know, idleness of large tracts of state-owned land and tribal trust land where no property rights exist. They exist in a sort of constitutional twilight zone where people don't have the rights to the property that they're living on, working on, and, and are investing in. And so our approach is start with the low-hanging fruit. And that's what we've done in a place like Cape Town. Use well-located municipal, uh, provincial, and state land to embark upon meaningful land reform programs where you're giving ownership. The hunger for land in South Africa is not farms. And like, the hunger for land is in the urban areas. People want to be close to schools and access services. It's the urban and peri-urban environment where the hunger for land exists. And so what we've done in the Western Cape is in Pinelands, uh, to break the apartheid era spatial planning. We've built a huge um, mixed use development in Pinelands where you've got social housing mixed with bonded housing, mixed with rental units and rental stock, all underpinned in a public private partnership that has built a community, not a starter slum. Uh, land reform is not about building slums on the outskirts of cities and saying, well, there we've addressed the, the hunger for housing and, and land. It's about giving people a meaningful opportunity and giving them title where you can so that they own that property in South Africa. And the highest number of successful land reform projects in the Western Cape. Highest number of title deeds handed over by DA governments because we are passionate about turning people into land owners. But we're never going to solve the problem in South Africa if we don't start with what the real impediments to land reform are, and that has been entirely missed in this wasted three years of a constitutional amendment which we were able to defeat. Xenophobia is a huge problem, and it's a, a huge risk for South Africa, and unfortunately it's been used by politicians in South Africa to take advantage of a terribly desperate situation of low economic growth, high unemployment, and very little prospects for the future. When resources dwindle, people start to fight more over them. And when opportunity dries up, people become far more aggressive around being able to access it. And so the heart of the problem lies in the fact that there is no growing opportunity in South Africa. There is no growing economy. And so the natural thing to do is to turn on people who are not like me. And the short-termism being practiced by certain politicians in South Africa of driving this wedge they are going to saddle a tiger that they will never be able to ride. And I say that for the reason simply this. First of all, it's wrong. It's wrong to victimize people because they have a certain culture, look, language, or, or they're not the same and, and look different to us. It is a fundamentally dangerous path to go down. It is even more dangerous in a place like South Africa, which is already fractured by different races, tribes, languages, cultures. And you may think you're starting a bushfire in the foreigner camp, but I can tell you that fire will, lump, will jump the fences in South Africa, and eventually we'll have a full-blown race war on, on our hands in South Africa, because that is the inevitable outcome of the short-sighted and, and I think, abhorrent 
behavior of some of the politicians in South Africa who are actively stirring people up against, against fellow Africans. That being said, we have to have strong borders. Every successful country in the world, the most liberal countries in the world, have the, some of the strongest borders. Canada and, and New Zealand have strong borders. Making sure we're controlling immigration who's coming into South Africa, that's important for any country to be able to sustain itself. But what you can't do is target people who, who are from a different part of Africa. And if one country on the continent should understand and appreciate that, it's South Africa, whose citizens were shielded under the worst jackboot days of the apartheid government in other countries on the continent. And we should know better in South Africa. And that's why we've been calling on fellow politicians, political party leaders, just mark what you say, because what you say has consequences. You may blurt something out at a podium, but it could end up with someone being killed in a shack in Shoshanguve, or someone's shop being ransacked in downtown Johannesburg. There are consequences for what you say. What are we doing? Our mayors in our cities, and particularly Cape Town, we have a large immigrant population in Cape Town, uh, go out and have been speaking out against xenophobic violence. Leaders must lead in times of crisis. You can't sit back and allow things that are abhorrent to take place and not say anything about it. We must also then dispel the myths that exist. Foreigners are responsible for all the crime in South Africa. It's simply not true. If you look at the crime statistics, it's not true. It, it, invariably, people who are in the country and who are not citizens generally like to fly below the radar. They don't want to get involved in something that could see them being sent back to a country that's war-torn. So they don't get involved in those sorts of things. So you mustn't generalize and say the crime problem is because of foreigners. We mustn't say they're taking up all the opportunities. Yes, it may be the case in some of the low-level jobs, but invariably these are people who are bringing entrepreneurial ideas and opening businesses and in doing so, stimulating the local economy and hiring people to assist them. There was a great article three years ago in The Economist called Light Bulbs and Their Luggage, which examined the fact that a net inflow of immigrants often helps stimulate your economy rather than detract from it. And so we've got to distinguish, I believe, between illegal, people who are in a country illegally and people who are there legally, and we need to make sure that we are securing our borders against a walk across you know, the border which currently exists in South Africa, where you know, uh, Minister Dill put up what was colloquially known in South Africa as a washing line now. We paid millions for a roll of barbed wire. Our borders are too porous, and we need to sort that out and stop it. But what we cannot do is allow South Africa to generate into a situation where foreigners are being burnt, targeted, killed, and murdered, because that will jump fences. And then you're going to end up with tribal uh, conflict. You're going to end up with language conflict. You're going to end up with race conflict, geographic conflict. And in a country like South Africa, it's the worst possible outcome for us. So I think there should be international pressure and local pressure on political leaders to be responsible in what they're saying. Do not incite and inflame something which you know could see the country turn into a pile of ashes. Yes. John, thank you very much. Uh, we are on borrowed time, uh, but I will take one more, which will be from uh, the gentleman in the oh, yellow yes. tie. <laughs> the gentleman in the yellow tie uh, on the end of the middle row there. Mm -hmm. Please introduce yourself. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Johnny Oates, uh, member of the House of Lords and uh, co-chair of the reconstituted all-party parliamentary group on South Africa. Uh, and just on that point, um, we discovered during the red listing of South Africa during COVID, I discovered at least, there was no all-party parliamentary group on South Africa. And I think that sort of reflected a drift in the relationships between the UK and, 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 and South Africa and certainly Parliament's attention. So I wonder if you might comment on that. And then a specific uh, question uh, with another hat on, which is as co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Zimbabwe. Um, uh, and I wondered if you could comment on the fact that, as I understand it at the moment, a large number of Zimbabweans in South Africa will find their work permits, their right to stay in, in South Africa, expire um, at the end of the year. And that could have potentially catastrophic consequences in the region. I wondered if you could comment on that. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Lord Oates, and it's uh, a real honour to have you here today, so thanks very much. Um, yeah, I think that our parliaments should um, have a closer relationship. 
I've been involved in, in a few relationships with people in parliaments around the world, particularly monitoring Russia and China's influence in Africa and in other parts of the world. And I think there are, there should be cooperation. And as parliamentarians, we should be speaking with each other. Um, you know, I think there's lots to learn from each other. And I think that that networking collaboration is important. Zimbabwe worries me um, for, for a number of reasons because, I mean, inside Zimbabwe as well, there's some pretty hectic stuff going on there that I think the world's attention has been distracted a lot by Ukraine. And it's sort of off some of these other areas around the world where there's some pretty atrocious things happening. Uh, democracy is not alive in, in Zimbabwe. There's still the Mugabe regime has essentially been extended by Manangagwa. And some of the atrocities against the opposition uh, continue to this day. In terms of Zimbabwe and Zimbabwean South Africans, it's exactly what I was talking about. There you've got people who are here legally. If you have a work permit, you are here legally in South Africa. It means that you've gone through the process, that you've applied, that you've provided documentation, and you've been certified. Why would you punish the people that are in the country legally by expelling them? Because what you're going to do then is encourage more illegal immigration. At least with people who've got work permits from, that are here from Zimbabwe, you know how many there are, you know where they live, you know what they're doing, you have a handle on it. We've got no handle on, on the people who are not documented, who have not applied for those permits. So it's an absolute uh, farcical case, which is why there's growing groundswell opposition in South Africa towards, towards us. Also, many of those people are providing incredible services. The teacher of the year last year on mathematics was a Zimbabwean uh, teacher who was here on a work permit. And you know, our math skills are amongst the worst on the continent and internationally. Well, how would you expel people who are bringing in a scarce skill just because you want to make some political point because you'd rather scapegoat Zimbabweans than actually admit that your government's policy has failed so spectacularly and you've done such a terrible job in, in managing, uh, managing uh, government in South Africa. So it's easier to just scapegoat, uh, scapegoat Zimbabweans. So there is ground throwing, uh, a groundswell against it. There is a court challenge that's being brought as well and by a number of civil society bodies against the ban. And um, I think the courts are going to take a dim view of government's attempts here, particularly because they're going after the wrong people. They're not going after the illegal immigrants. They're going after legal people who've, who've jumped through all of the hoops and are there legally and are contributing in the economy and providing skills that South Africa invariably doesn't have in some of these instances. So um, yeah, we we obviously very concerned about that as well. But thank you very much. Oh, it's been a you. wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the people who have joined us on Zoom uh, and for staying uh, over time. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all in the room for, for coming to this uh, event this evening. Uh, we are starting back up with uh, more and more uh, of these hybrid kind of events, and we're uh, delighted that we were able to welcome you back today. Uh, and I'd now like to invite you all uh, in thanking our speaker here this evening, John Stinhaze, and the leader of the Thank you very much.